for our present discussion, we may pick up the following lines, we strike to be pretty different in inspiration and technique when compared with the lines surrounding them. Our minds hush to a bright omnipotent 10.21. The murmuring tongue of a celestial fire 10.23. A silence overheard an inner voice 10.23 and the heart of the mystery of the journey is 10.30. These lines can be scanned as follows. Our mind has to a bright omniscient, the murmuring tongue of a celestial fire, a silence overhead, an inner foil, and the heart of the mystery of the journey star. The first right here, with the associated previous line forms a beautiful stanza of the iterative technique culminating in the revelatory bright omniscient. It runs as follows. The truth mind could not know and raise his face. We hear what mortal ears and never heard. We feel what earthly sense has never failed. We love what common has repelled and read. Our mind has to a bright omniscient. 10.21. Trocky, as the second foot in the first line, prepares with a kind of convincing dip the iambic movement in the following. We hear, we feel, we love. Hell becomes our mind. And then again a dip in hush to talk it. There are 19 I am sandwiched between two truckies. The effect is the general overhead narrative preparation of one speech unto the reality. Our minds hush to a bright omniscient. The adjective omniscient used as a noun is a master stroke of inspiration. Amalkiran speaks of this line as full of atmosphere, of course, which is there, and more than that, it is spiritual charge it bears in the substance and visualization and movement. Every word and every syllable is in its apt place. Change, for instance, omniscient to omniscience and the line collapses. The echoing back and forth of the alliterative brings powerful overtone to enrich its music that is full of silence. Rare is such music that is full of silence. In contrast to this packed intensity, gaming with spiritual in its gold bright we have the purling of a celestial fire in its soft, gentle, replaced movement. Or through the earthly covering, something breaks. A grace and beauty of spiritual light, the murmuring tongue of a celestial fire, our self and its sight. Danger whom we feel, it is and acts unseen as if it were not. The line, the murmuring tongue of a celestial fire is lyric spiritual with more of sound color than overtones and undertones, though the latter can be said to be manifestly present. It has a kind of believable mystical glow. But the, but the distinctness of the spiritual comes home with a convincingness in a silent overhead and inner volume, which in substance is supported by what it follows. A silent overhead and inner volume, a living image seated in the heart, an unwalled wideness 
and a fathomless point, the truth of still, the truth of all these cryptic souls being the real to us with our striving moon, the secret grandiose meaning of our life. Here is silence that becomes golden. It holding with the inner voice, gazing and effortless overtone in the delight of the world. And the line and the heart of the mystery of the journey in here. And the heart of the mystery of the journey in here. As we are already seen, is unusual with four anapes with a pyrrhic in the middle. Always we hear in us magic key conceived in life's hermetic envelope, a burning witness in the sanctuary regards to time and the blind walls of form. A timeless light is in the hidden eyes. He sees the secret thing. No words can feel and know the goal of the unconscious world and the heart of the mystery of the journey. Even. What we see in these four examples is the sound modulation in varying degrees in different contexts. What we hear are the harmonics lower and higher in the richness that belongs to the overhead silence itself. There is more of overhead in them than the inner psychic, more of the mystic spiritual than the intimate lyrical, more of Vedantic than the occult. They become powerfully overhead. Vedic poetry is poetry on the plane of intuitional vision. Poetry on the plane of intuitional vision. That is the Vedic poetry. There is rhythm, there is force, there are other elements of poetry in it, in the Vedic poetry. But the psychic statement, but the psychic element is not so prominent. It also means that there are overtones in rich abundance than undertones. It is from a plane much higher than the mental. It moves the vision on the plane of confusion. Though there are passages in which one may find the psychic element. It is a wide and calm plane. It also moves one, but not in the same way as a poetry which contains the psychic feeling. It has got its own depth. A psychic poetry differs from it in a depth and feeling. There is also inevitably a strong subjective element in our appreciation which adds its own musical overtone and undertone to what we read and delight in. A land of mountains and wide sunbeat plain. I'm reading 95.1. A land of mountains and wise sunbeat plain, and giant rivers pacing to what see a field of creation, a spiritual realm, silence following life's act into this deal of thoughts, tenement, of thoughts transcendent climb and heavenward leave, a brooding world of river and tram filled with the white mightiest words of God and man, where nature seems a stream of the divine, and beauty and grace and grandeur had their home, harbored the childhood of the incarnate flame. That is about the place where Savitri was born and was brought up as a child. Take the line with the following scansion. A field of creation and spiritual love. A field of creation and spiritual love. This has, I am an apis, spirit, talky, an apis. A field of creation and spiritual.
spiritual passion. The undertone which is there in the trocky anapest of spiritual hush in the last two feet would get lost if it is going to be scanned as dactyl am spiritual hush. This is something that can be easily felt. Shevendu declared that the whole lyric is his ode on a Grecian urn. He is talking about Kirsis ode on the Grecian earth. And he says that it is all overtones. The whole ode is all overtones. O oh, Attic Sail, fair attitude with breadth of marvel men and maidens overrun with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou silent form, the teaser out of thought as the eternity, soul pastoral, when old shall, when old shall, when old age shall, this generation will, thou shall remain in midst of other woe than our, a friend to man to whom thou shall, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all you need to know. The ode has everything going for it. Exquisite verbal music, profound ideas, great humanism, and inevitable phrasing full of overtones. This is a perfectly inspired piece which has come straight from the realms of gold. It has exquisite music and intuitive thought and visualization of the timeless help the fleeting and passing, the immortalized static time, and there is something very deep, something ever haunting in thou silent form, the teaser out of thought as that eternity. In a certain sense, we the enjama more profound than the famous truth beauty equation in the last two lines. In this line, the undertone is more magical and mystical than the factual looking assertion of the truth beauty line. Versification in classical Sanskrit prosody is of three kinds in the classical Sanskrit prosody. The first is akshara vratta or syllabic verse. Meters depend on the number of syllables in a verse. With relative freedom in the distribution of light and heavy syllables. The second is syllable quantitative verse. Varna vritta. First is akshara vritta. Second is varna vritta. Meters depend on syllable count. But the light heavy patterns are fixed. Quantitative verse or matra vritta. Meters depend on duration where each verse line has a fixed number of morides, usually grouped in sets of four. Mora is a unit of sound that determines syllable. Mora is a unit of sound that determines syllable weight in some languages. In poetry, meter is the basic element that goes in making its poetic structure which is a sequence of distinct feet, it providing a measure for its movement. These feet to be based on the quantity of sound, based on the quantity of sound, or on stress, or on accent. Accent a syllable carries in a foot. Thus, we have three. Either the quantity of sound, or the stress or the accent. Or we can have certain combinations of all the three in this way. An awful silence for this tragic time on 8.26. We have five conjugative amps. An awful silence for this tragic time. We have five conjugative amps, short, long, 
Desim, 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 desim. Had this continued on, on and on, if I become infelicitous with a monotonous beat. In Savitri, such monotony is avoided by sweet variation. This is particularly necessary in end stops of blank verse that Savitri is using. Thus, in the line next to it, pain is the hand of nature, pain is the hand of nature, sultering men, pain is the hand of nature, sultering men. We read these two lines together, an awful silence of this tragic time, pain is the hand of nature, sultering men. A sudden variation in foot construction has given a different effect altogether. Pain is the hand of nature, sultering men. Zim, zi, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zi, zim. And the earlier line was simply zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim. The variation introduces a subtle overtone as if convincing about the greatness of utility of fame in our life. The rhythmic moment is often governed by a short pause in the flow, by a cut, a casura appropriately somewhere in the middle of the line. In the above line, there is that pause after nature. Pain the hand of nature, sculpturing men. So there is a natural pause after the first wave. Pain the hand of nature, sculpturing men. He who saves the rain must save his pain. Where there is a slight break after the third foot. He who saves the rain must share his pain. That is how it comes. Zim, zi, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim, zi, zim. Never in Savitri we have a headless verse. A headless verse where the first syllable is lacking in the first book. Nor catalysis, the end of line shortened to a single 